Okay. Hello, everyone. Welcome to this evening's episode. I am a bit nasally, so bear with me if there's pauses and whatnot. But I would say this episode was inspired by a sentence that I wrote. What if light was hitting space and matter is the shadow of space? This idea should be engaged poetically, but I think there is some value in wondering if existence is the shadow of, our, of potentially not just light, but it's as if like, could we be the shadow, could, temp <clears throat> could matter be the shadow of uh, a phenomena that is not material? You know, there was this mathematician, I, I believe his name was Archimedes, I could be wrong, but there was this mathematician who had managed to guess, uh, this Greek mathematician, <clears throat> or Athenian, but it was like, I would tell you that uh, this mathematician, back in the day, had found a way to measure or to get a very close estimate of the height of the pyramids and this man implemented an incredible strategy this mathematician it was impossible at that time to somehow find a way to vertically measure <clears throat> but I would tell you that this mathematician pretty much looked at a sundial and uh, did the ratios of the shadow of the sundial to the sundial at a certain hour and uh, did the ratio of the distance of the shadow of the pyramid compared to the pyramid and he came to a very close accurate number you know you see for Archimedes I, I believe that was him. Uh, for the for that Greek mathematician, he used the shadow in that way. We have people such as Carl Jung. He uses the shadow in another way. <laughs> you know, he sees the shadow as uh, what the person has not dared look within themselves yet. You know, your shadow is phenomenal because if you look at your shadow, you don't see the light. But if you turn around instantly, your shadow isn't there. You know, that means you can instantly shift from the view of the shadow. We can say shadows are the sun's magic trick. Now, <clears throat> the question comes, usually something that leaves behind the shadow has a form. Now, if space was like an object where light was hitting space and matter was a shadow,
it would as if be as if uh, I mean even before concluding matter as the shadow of space just to wonder if space has a shadow <clears throat> there is no form but it doesn't mean there isn't a shadow you know and of course it's very hard to define space it's like what is space to even have a shadow we uh, treat space as absence. It's like the human being opens its eyes and there is an introduction to reality. <clears throat> and I would say materiality, spelled with two T's. That life begins to matter. So we see a world, we're told this world is matter, then we wonder where the world is and we notice the immaterial and a relationship the human mind has to the immaterial is space. Now to <clears throat> wonder about the, like the sun's light hitting in, okay, I'll say this, there's a quote from Hafez, this Sufi mystic poet. He says, uh, <clears throat> I don't remember the exact lines, but the imagery of it is where Hafez is saying the truth is like how the sun's light casts endless shadows. What it means is that like there is as many, you can say, small truths as much as the sun creates shadows on earth from different forms. That means based on the position and form you are and based on the light of the world, I mean, taking a bit out of the context of space, but <clears throat> it's as if we can say our thoughts, beliefs, and ideology are the shadow. They are sh the shadow of the presence of the moment. And you know, it's like if, you, if a person sits somewhere for a couple hours, you can actually notice the sun moving, you know? Let me see if I can find that quote from Arthur. You know, I couldn't find the exact poet, uh, poem from Hafez, but I found a poem from Rumi. He says, what is the body? The shadow of a shadow of your love that somehow contains the entire universe.
Excuse me. Guys, there may be long pauses in this episode, just letting people know in case of it. Very taste them. Even though patience is a virtue, as it is said. What I'm trying to say with that Hafez imagery, pretty much, is that the truth, it has one source, but its effect is multiple. You know? So what that means is one you can say there is one sun, and it is the light of this sun that illuminates all the forms on earth. It's as if energy, energy's animate movements is the flickering candle in, in non-existence's void. There's so many ways to establish uh, relationships of meaning. There's just so many ways to look at life that it becomes chaotic to just contain it in one way, you know? And really, the ethic of man when it comes to efficiency and advancement is just to reach for the inconceivable. To reach for the inconceivable means to discover how you are in conception, how you are in conception. You know, I am uh, an object and a subject right now speaking to you. And it's strange because the world we live in right now can't see beyond this honestly beyond visuals and sounds <clears throat> we can't fathom any sort of truth that means what kind of truth would be fine if there was no sight what kind of truth would be fine if there was no sound can you imagine can you imagine just being conscious in a silent universe and that's a sign the biggest sign 
of consciousness is making noise. And I feel when mouths, when the mouth developed, consciousness began. I would say the mouth is earlier than the eyes. You know, it's like when you look at the mouth, it can open and close. When you look at the eyelids, the eyelids can open and close when you're looking at human, <clears throat> the human genetics, right? The whole species design. But when you look at the ears, they can't open and close. You know, it's as if the ears were made at a different time or for a differentness and like different, you know, there's a difference, you know. That means we can't just close our ears. Like I find that to be incredible, you know, and it's because our ears, there's bones inside the three, there's these three tiny bones inside the ear that these three bones are required even for balance. That means if something happens to the person's ear, their balance goes off. You know, <clears throat> I feel um, maybe this world of ours Our free will is simply between looking at the shadow, looking at our shadow, or looking at the sun. I mean, I'm just imagine a person. What options do you have? You look at the source. Let's say you're looking at your shadow first, okay? And you're like, yo, why is this shadow here? And you notice the sun, its source. <clears throat> and so you try to look at the source, and you can't stare into the sun. You know, there's a sort of blindness that follows. So what it is, is literally the sun is the metaphor for the inconceivable truth. And I would say our shadow is the metaphor for the linguistic simulation. <clears throat> now, I'm also trying to think, how would the, sh uh, how would the sun cast a, sh a, a shadow to space even? Now, it could make sense, you know, perhaps in a very strange way, that if the sun wasn't in this dimension, was beyond this dimension, but somehow still in it, then the sun could cast the shadow to space. So what it means is like, 
<clears throat> the person, our eyes are not like a chameleon, you know, like a chameleon, the animal. Its eyes are like, like its left eye is seeing the left side of its body and its right eye is completely seeing its right eye, as if its two eyes can move on. The brain of the chameleon has the ability to move its eyes without coordination. Usually human eyes move with coordination. Somebody tells you to look right, both eyes move right. You know, somebody tells you to look left, both eyes left, move left. <clears throat> you know? So imagine <clears throat> that the shadow self and the light self, two types of self, and somehow you find a way to notice both of them. That means if we had eyes at the back of our head, I mean, it's kind of strange, you know? Like sometimes I wonder why like evolution didn't care for behind the head of the animal, you know? <laughs> it's like nature was like, yeah, just eyes in, in the front, you know, that's it. <laughs> it's as if you can say poetically, you know, why, why are our eyes on the front of our head? You know, because life goes forward. <laughs> Relaxation time in the chat section says the sun is made of hydrogen atoms fusing two by two into helium. Yes, it's a giant ball of gas. It's the sun's tiny concentration of heavier elements, which astronomers call metals that controls its fate. <clears throat> so seems like relaxation time. You're saying astronomers like heavy metal. <laughs> yeah, you see, I'm not ignoring the elemental position of the realm. For me, I'm not saying like, I'm not dismissing the periodic table. You know, I've, I've placed a lot of my ideologies on that table, believe it or not, you know. <laughs> For now, my car keys are on the periodic table as a beam. No, uh, relaxation time, I don't think you, uh, I think you missed my humor there, but, uh, <clears throat> um, <sighs> honestly, 
we have access to the observable universe and we also have access to what I would say in an archaic way we have called the imaginary universe <clears throat> but in a modern way you can say abstraction is the uh, uh, the novel extension of reality so I would say that um, it's as if like something is happening here and existence is like the alphabet and experience is like the speech you know so as I'm existing here as a being really the way <clears throat> I personally feel in this moment I feel as if existence is all being accessed in one moment. And it's that experience in order to do something with this holistic moment has to classify. So we have to create the illusion so we get a sense that we are separate from the truth. Then after realizing we're separate from the truth, all that is left is to return to it. <clears throat> you can say in one view, life is like, yeah, you're born and you die. Or you can also perceive it in this way where it's as if like you're climbing this mountain and this is just one part of the mountain, you know? That means it's, it's literally a phase. You can say it's like, Sometimes I feel like the moment is like a piano. Literally, all that is in attention is being played. That means it's like in this moment, I am conscious of my voice. I'm conscious of the environment. Various senses, each doing their own thing. It's as if like the body is a company and the sensory perception are employees. And it's like every morning you wake up and you're like, okay, show me what you did. You know, show me what you did. Yes. <laughs> or at the end of the day, you know, <clears throat> before the person, I'm just saying like, it's like, there's so many, this world is made to try things out. And when you think about it, it's all about expanding the archive of experience. It's like, what are eight billion creatures doing on a rock? Experiential expansion. What else? It's as if it feels to me like something is living here and its appearance is a civilization of humans. <clears throat> and really, to get to this point, like this is the tricky part of mysticism, where you run back, you reverse engineer to the truth, and you actually destroy the question. <laughs> so, you, so I would say mysticism is that funny thing where the truth seekers like truth. Where are you? You know, the truth seekers seeking truth, and while the truth seeker is seeking truth, in the middle, it's like, wait, who is seeking for truth? How do I know truth isn't here? You know, that means it's like, <clears throat> it is true, like, you know, it's like, how do you know, it, it's like, how do we, if we, if I was to say, like, we know we are a temporary being, but how do we know we are not an eternal being? How do we know we are not? Do you see? Like, from one angle, to reject the unknown is just... 
hard to watch. You know, there's a story which it comes from <clears throat> theology, and I would say uh, uh, it was something, a story I heard in Iran, but it was a religious story, you know. And so it's the story that, uh, and of course, anybody listening to this, I am sharing this respectfully and politely, <clears throat> but above all for, for the conceptual vision of it, to, to see the geometry of uh, the image, the idea. <clears throat> so there is this story, you see there's a lot of prophet stories, for example, Moses opened the Red Sea, uh, Christ walked on water. Now for uh, the prophet of Islam, Muhammad, there's a story that when he was young, I believe four years old, it's a story, this is a sixth century story, but I'm saying when he was young, there was this story where there was this idea that the archetype of, <clears throat> let's say, evil or duality in some sense, it's as if they had this idea that it's like the concept of the devil pinches every person's heart. That's why children cry when they're born. Like, it was this superstitious perspective, but the idea, uh, it wasn't in any sort of revelatory thing, but it was, it was just this idea back in the day they had. And so there's this story that it's like there's this four-year-old uh, kid, uh, uh, excuse me, a uh, four-year-old, um, a bunch of four-year-old kids and the prophet, the prophet of Islam at the age of four. And so what happens is, uh, uh, what happens is, <laughs> what happens in the story is that suddenly uh, this archangel Ezra, the archangel of death appears and comes and pinches, uh, takes away something from the heart of this four-year-old to be prophet of a religion. And so... What happens is that this it's as if the archangel Ezra takes uh, away the, uh, the pinch of uh, Satan from the heart of this child. You know, there was that kind of idea in it. You know, that there was a chaos and this chaos was taken. You know, uh, it was taken away by, by the outside. That means something from the outside came and something from the outside took away that which had came. I, I don't know if I'm using the right words. <laughs> but uh, <clears throat> the whole idea of it is not to see the language, I would say, what. I don't know, pretty much this idea that there's two natures, as if we have two brain hemispheres. So think of it as if one part of man is open to destruction and one part of man is open to construction, to creation. Now that destructive urge needs to be responded to and the constructive urge needs to be responded to in the being. So again, looking at the sun, with the inconceivability of the truth and then being content with how the shadow is the effect of the truth. You know, I would say that's one thing that from Abrahamic religions I, I found interesting that there is a transcendental dimension that it was an interaction with, honestly, the invisible. 
pretty much human beings have had relationships with the invisible phenomena, and eventually it has gotten to the invisible. Now the error is, in, uh, we, uh, we, we treat the invisible, you're trying to comprehend the invisible through visible, and I find this is why poetry is profound. Because the visible can never define the invisible, so when the visible shakes, when the language for the visible shakes, we get glimpses of the invisible. It's like if your whole life you've been looking at the branches of knowledge. <clears throat> it's as if you are now noticing the space between those branches. It is honestly a movement. And the meaning of life can be imposed put the meaning there. Or you could see the meaning never there. That's how profound it is. This is why I would say, because there's so many ways to look at life, we can never be defined by one way of looking at life. This renders the creature of dimension. That means whether we like it or not, if we are multidimensional, really or not, okay, our language and our psychology and then everything else is multidimensional. So we have literally built a civilization for a multidimensional being, but when it comes to the human being, we're treating it in a single dimension. That means we have allowed our visual sensory perception to become the captain of the ship of me. But it's like a person noticing an optical illusion and being like, what the fuck? Like, excuse me, but it's like, it's like they say, I gotta see it to believe it, but then there's magic. Magic shows, illusionists, David Copperfield, level of victim. Okay. So it's like, <laughs> it's like, I don't know. It's like, I, I used to want to see it to believe it, but now it's as if like, does it matter? I see it or not. <laughs> if there's optical illusions in nature, you know, it's like really the big question is what is a mind doing in the void? And I honestly feel <clears throat> we are like a, a finger of uh, a palm, our universe. I feel this may sound strange, but I feel literally our body has a geometry that is too unique. I am telling you, like there is something where it's as if like uh, the human biology is like an ex, it's, it's, I would say it's like an extraterrestrial Morse code method, Morse code or something. <laughs> There's something I also say about evolution that I feel this creature stood up too early when you look at how we're designed, where we stood up to her, something caused this animal to stand up. And sometimes I wonder, could it be like static electricity? You see, for example, the hair on, you know, on the head of the person, suddenly when the charges shift it's like the head of the person the hair just goes straight sometimes i'm wondering could it be that evolutionary animals are like the hair of the planet and they suddenly like they become straight <laughs> <laughs> or we can say it was like this is why the animals stood up the evolutionary uh, creatures stood up why because it was like I've had it with smelling this dirt. God damn. <laughs> could, could, that was a sort of enlightenment. The moment the, the creature's head could trust higher dimensions. Like, just think about how fascinating it is. The position of our head was closer to the ground. So we can say sight, 
started on a very horizontal level. Like, can you just imagine this? Imagine being a cell, a cell, like there's this view that genetically, like on a cellular level, like cells have survived apocalypses, but no other creatures. <clears throat> you know? So imagine sight from underneath water, starting from on the ground of the ocean, and then ending up it, it stretching. So from the bottom, you know, you know how Drake says we started from the bottom, now we're here. That's literally evolution. <laughs> we started from the bottom of the sea, now we're here, you know. So uh, <clears throat> so I would say now think about it. So the eyes were closer to the earth. And all that the eyes have been doing are to lift up. I think the purpose of sight, wow, it's literally like light. The sun is speaking to the creature to lift it up beyond the atmosphere. The sun is speaking to us through sight. Like how next level is that? And let me tell you what I mean. Like, just to re-emphasize this, some brush strokes you got to do it more than once. <laughs> Imagine the sun is like looking at all the creatures on the earth poetically and being like, come to me. And imagine like a command, a, a galactic solar <clears throat> and so light is is literally lifting up in animate potential towards animate kinetic reality. I feel the sun is our intelligence our bodies are earth but our minds are dependent on light and space so light and space are the parents of our mind. Actually, they're just they're just the parents of the mind. And the mind. <laughs> like everything has to do with space and what you see in that space. You know, I, I would say I have this strange <clears throat> phobia sometimes. It's as if, like, sometimes before I close my eyes and sleep, I wonder if that's the last moment that I'm in existence. Sometimes I wonder what's going to happen in my sleep. Like, you know, there's that kind of idea. But you realize there's so many unknown variables in life that to try to, at the same time, calculate everything is insanity. Literally, there's too much information that drives you crazy. There's too many levels of maintenance of values and potentials of those values. That means I would say <clears throat> the intellect is literally, its purpose is to build AI. Once we build AI, AI is going to change our own intellect. So we need as much intellect as we can get AI uh, proper, like a proper AI's eyes to it. And then in the future, let's say 200, 400 years, most likely there will be mavericks in the tech sector. That means we haven't seen it before. We're going to go through a medieval dark ages of technology, of, of, inter of for the first time, the intimacy of technology with inside the skin of a human being. More than medical sciences and surgery I would not really have. You know? <clears throat> but I'm just saying simply. are the doors to the universe. Or you know how they said the eyes are the windows to the soul? Imagine it's the other way. 
so does the whole world that's going into the eyes of the person. And so really, you know what it is? We're really, as a species, left in an Oliver Twist scenario when it comes to cosmic truth. Literally, we're like, with an empty plate waiting to get a bit more grub. <laughs> so it's, uh, it's all a beautiful story. All of it. It's as if like it, all of existence is a giant canvas and there's just endless brushes moving on it and so you uh, are one of the brushes even me i'm one of the brushes imagine you're one of the brushes 800 brushes painting what the human existence means experientially and so some brushes are perhaps first painted then stopped painting then realize the meaning of life is to paint, but not to paint in doubt. That means there was a point where I would say, really the meaning of life was left towards decoding mystery. But it also goes towards service. I can't emphasize this enough. You, it's like I'm telling you. There's some people who they serve themselves. There's some people who serve others, you know, serve their family. There's some people who serve their, I don't know, whatever group they're in. And there's some people, let's say, who serve their nation. And then there's some people who serve their planet. Then there's some people, let's say, who serve their, uh, let's say they serve their species and their planet. Then they serve their solar system. Then there are people who serve their uh, uh, universe, imagine, their galaxy and then their universe. Do you see the levels of service, the levels of give and take? You know? It's like you take to have energy and then you use that energy to give back something. Literally, it's like it's like playing, it's like two people throwing the baseball, you know, back and forth. Literally, it's like that. Where the person moves, decisions are made, then effects occur. So, pretty much if you feel you are, like, let's say life is just this massive multinational system of endless cause and effect probably. So let's say, in, in this life, if we choose to not be in the causal position of our moment, we have no mind. Oh, sorry, excuse me, if we choose to if, if we choose to be in the effect, I was thinking effect, but I said cause. Uh, in, the, in the effect, <clears throat> uh, if we were, I'm trying to say pretty much that if you don't move life, most likely you will be moved by life. Now, it could be that when you're younger, it's okay to be moved by life, but eventually after some point, you require to move life. You require to input into the system from input into the outer world. So, right now I'm sitting here, if I just tell myself, yeah, my whole existence and experience and all my truths, they're just starting from this moment. This moment is causing my whole uh, being. It's causing my whole life, this moment. Right? So, if I feel in the causal position, my, free, my inner realms feel they can 
have a voice in the algorithms. But if you're in the effect <coughs> position, then you have no voice. That means it's honestly the case. If I stop caring about this world, I'll stop. It's like anybody who doesn't care for the world, soon you will stop caring for yourself. So the algorithm is, while you're in the world, caring for it. And uh, I don't know, love your way towards freedom. <laughs> You know, our verbal truths are based on light. So really, I'm, I'm considering it now that what can language do? It can either be a mirror, or it can be a finger pointing to something. That's all that language can do. Language can never replace, <clears throat> like, uh, the actuality, you know, it's like the Zen master who said this thing where he said a picture of a cake won't satisfy you. It's like you can't eat a picture of a cake. <laughs> <clears throat> Imagine someone who found like a very low resolution picture of a cake and they printed it with a printer that was only black and white. It's like you can't eat that cake. <laughs> The language can never replace the experience. You know, in the most simplest way of perceiving reality, it is just a movement. And even what we call reality is like just the conscious waking state. So there's even dream states. So it's like, imagine after we figured out conscious waking reality, we'd be like, yeah, what do we do with the, <clears throat> you know, all this dream psychology around?
know it's like man is here to reveal the secret of his own lives. The human being is here to see how the human is being. And it makes me feel <clears throat> we are higher dimensional surveillance. We are like cameras where the cameraman uh, isn't in uh, duality. You know, what if consciousness was actually not from the brain? What if it was inside the light? I know this sounds strange, but <clears throat> I, I feel light, of course, it's the smallest energy carrying system. So as the smallest energy carrying system, I feel it has geometrical data inside it. Geometrical <clears throat> instruction and I feel it's the geometrical instruction in light beams that really has sculpted the human being you can say. that means there is self evolution infused with influences from outside so we can never think evolution is a one sided thing That means to consider that evolution and survival of the fittest is, is, is just one side of the coin. That means it's not just what the animal did that got it here. It's what the world did to the animal as well. That means literally we owe the events in history for, uh, again, sculpting our brain. That means different parts of the brain, they took This process of sophistication sometimes it blows my mind where evolution implies we grew out of the world. Just taking that idea. That means it's it's like it's so fascinating that everybody right now, every human being, was once a cell. Just take that in. Just consider that that you right now people are being like look at how many dictators there have been history. All of these uh, dictators were a tiny cell and this tiny cell emerged with the potential of changing the world whether for good or bad that means it's just mind blowing it's mind we should just slow hand clap for the mysterious ability of cells that's it <laughs> I believe it was in yesterday's talk where I shared the metaphor of the host. And in a sense, imagine that you're a guest in this world. That means you've been invited to a party, you've entered the house, you know, the house, and let's say it's a legitimate party. <clears throat> and so the host is not there, but you are there, and these other people are there too. Eight billion other people are there too. And so we're waiting for the host. And some people in the room say they have seen the host before. Some people say the host doesn't exist, you know. <clears throat> you know? But all human beings, all the guests in this house party, you know, cosmic house party, are just waiting. Wondering. That means whatever belief system you have or disbelief system you have, we are all left 
as unknown. <clears throat> uh, wonder that is waiting. I would say that's really the next thing. I think it's a preparation. telling you, the intelligence is honestly, I could again say it's really like a candle, you can zoom in and out of anything in which you can have this notice and interconnectivity of the design. <clears throat> we can say depth uh, arises when your whole life you've been bird, living vertically and you suddenly notice a horizontal angle. And from one horizontal angle, you notice all your moments that vertical line could have had a horizontal dimension of perception. That means in every moment you have felt you were weak, you could have perceived yourself from a horizontal dimension strong, for example. strange feeling <clears throat> that I hope that the future generations don't have to experience. But I would say it's the feeling of dwelling in the hopeless. It's anguish. That's an emotion that I would say we our species is at the moment. Anguish and despair. And if the person moves me threshold and doesn't have the heart to be unknown to themselves, then they can't, you know, despair and anguish find any time. There is a desire, but there is no content. That's anguish. It's as if the person wants something better, but they don't know what, so they're in some sort of despair. <laughs> to remember. That means you're, you know, technically certain you want to speak about it when they say that it's, you know, <clears throat> like, you know, how people have spoken about the third eye, some people, they say in the heart's eye, where there has been certain figures in history where they say there, you know, there are gates of wisdom in the heart, and these gates of wisdom can be opened if they are required. That means is it's really when you experience beyond the language threshold that you see that we are in an Iron Man suit of a story and 
you step outside of that store, you can feel strangely the fresh non air. <clears throat> then when you return back into the logistics simulation, you better be here for work. I'm telling you this. Uh, this is a workstation in some strange way. Or I would like to, if I can say my personal preference, it's an air and every animal, every species, every creature, even the living, they will all at some point become conscious that the world never died. It is endlessly being moving within itself, as if every moment is a life. You know, it's as if like it's like this bread, you know, like breadcrumbs trail. Like a memory and a sense of self training. I can tell you, I have left behind so many versions of myself in this world. That it's strange, and in some sense, I don't even have fun. Because I have dismissed certain archetypes. Well, I will tell you <clears throat> from another angle by dismissing the archetypes, I also got rid of the dust on the tongue. And I will tell you that when I started training my mind as if it's alive, it's as if, like this may sound strange, but the day that you can be polite with the man in the mirror, with what you see in the mirror, is the day where the world no longer pushes you. Really, it does feel uh, like a symphony for the sensory perception. It's as if based on where the attention goes, the attention of the human being is like <coughs> uh, the orchestra conductor's kind of stick. The sensory perception, everything else is like the orchestra symphony taking place in accordance to how the attention moves. So your attention <coughs> is uh, processing, is playing, is is deciding how your sensory perception of the realm is played out. Your attention is the is your hands and all and information of your <clears throat> senses is like the piano keys.
you know, stories <clears throat> being carnage as well. Our attention tunnels through existence experientially. Our simplicity suggests the potential of how complex the new can be. Our energy levels remind us that thoughts are not in control. I would say really what we need is to see eight billion human beings as like eagles, imagine. And these eagles fly into the sky and they look at the planet. They look at human civilization, they get a better look, a direct experiential look, then they fly back into civilization. And any time they feel too caged, in civilization they fly out that's the thing about an advanced civilization an advanced civilization has the strategy of efficiency over ego and desire what does that mean that means we would try to build a system I honestly <clears throat> I would think of it this way uh, leaders of nations should invest a lot of the funding of a nation in making the nation beautiful and making the human psychology not only feel safe but feel comfortable enough to express the uniqueness of the universe. <clears throat> that means I will tell you uh, in, in the war of chaos and order, creativity is the only truth. We are so multidimensional <clears throat> and we have all, all, we are all worshipping the tip of the iceberg in such a ridiculous way. It's as if we are world worshipping. We are worshipping our eyes. Everyone is uh, eyes worshipping. <coughs> It's like, what do you believe in? My eyes, God damn it, my eyes. <clears throat> There's, of course, the presence of sight. I would say you look at a tree, you see the roots are in the soil. And yet the tree is there. So I feel our minds are rooted <clears throat> in the unobservable universe. I mean, simply by just saying observable and unobservable, that kind of renders dualism. The moment we have an observable universe and an unobservable universe, that's multiverse right there. <clears throat> that means we actually were entertaining a multiverse before we actually know reality to be. It's like, I like the term unicorn, universe, like one verse, as if all of manifestation has come to one verse in one of them. Like universe is like, I would say cosmos is the biggest word. <clears throat> or multiverse, these are words that their scale is so massive that it's like a person can't conceive it.
you know, in the chat section says eagle, lions, griffins. Yeah, the griffin archetype is very unique. I've actually strangely looked at that. For me, like for, as a hobby, sometimes I try to figure out why mythology is mythology. You know? <laughs> <clears throat> and really, it's symbolism. So we could say, like, for example, the half eagle, half lion. could be a representation of human nature. That means, let's say, back in the day, they said they saw a troll, like in, in folklore, I don't know, Scottish or Irish folklore, there was a troll or something. You know, like that idea could have been just behavior. Maybe there was someone acting. So, um, you know, to add more commentary to what you're saying, so the griffin can be in two ways. We can say if it can be the head of a lion and the body of an eagle. We can say it can have the head of an eagle and the body of a lion. And in both cases, there's wings. Strangely, in um, Persian mythology, or there's literally a place in Paris where at least there's a type of griffin where it's the head of a... eagle and body of a lion. It's a representation of vision and strength, vision and courage. Or you can say the kingly vision. <clears throat> we can say the griffin is the archetype of the king of all animals, the king of the sky, the eagle, and the king of and the king of the land, the king of the forest, the lion. So you can totally see how it was, it was like, how they got the inspiration for Griffin. They were like, what's the most superior creature in the sky? Eagle was the superior creature on the ground, the lion. So they just, it's a kingly archetype. It's a royal myth, mythological creature. I would say the Griffin is, is royal. It's royal archetypes. It's literally the king of the sky and the king of the land. <clears throat> it's pretty much like the ultimate witness <laughs> in Vedanta. You know. Guys, I may be a bit old school, but uh, for me, the concept of royalty, like if right now, in this, if, if we, this was medieval times and there was a king and queen to the realm, just a single king and queen, <clears throat> I would be in some sense like, I would uphold that level of honor towards that kingdom. Why? Because the symbol's presence is more important. You know, on a rock in the middle of nowhere, human beings really, back in the day, didn't have much to do. It was as if the mind, the imagination was way more ahead of, their, ahead of time than reality. But now, our reality is catching up to our imagination. And I would say it's at a break even. So right now, I feel it's like we're balancing it out. Maybe in the next 30 years, hopefully, we can be like 50% subjective life. This is the mind's life is active and 50% the body's. And the 
when I say 50%, that means I'm, I'm just, these are abstract percentages, what I'm saying. <clears throat> oh, these are percentages on abstraction, what I'm saying, like, If your real eyes are waiting for you, you know when when I when my eyes are open, the world has so much content. It's as if you don't even need imagination. It's as if the world has so much stuff to see already. But when you close your eyes, that's like an echo. That's like a ripple. It's literally the echo of the image of what the world was a second ago. I feel the healthiest approach is that we are <clears throat> unknown intelligence or yeah, we're unknown intelligence in a known form. That means really I can't tell you, the, like the mind is not an object. And I find it shock. Sometimes I feel maybe <clears throat> my personality is getting in the way of the concepts I'm sharing. Because the idea that the mind is not an object and even the mind is not the subject, which that's the, you get to the true unknown, the aka soul. Like, that idea is so intense that I feel it's flying past people's heads. That means space is alive regardless of if matter is there or not. Relaxation time says we are held down by our government. Maybe it's uh, time for relaxation there, you know? <laughs> I think the solution is relaxation time. This should be a movement, can you imagine? It's like, if time exists, so must relaxation. <laughs> I'm telling you, there's nothing wrong with, like, all the ways we're defining the world now and the future, they're going to be obsolete. <clears throat> there's not going to be any more good and bad. There's not going to be normal and strange. There's not going to be the color wheel of the there's just going to be this incredible patience to allow a multidimensional system to work itself out. In, in I, a lot of my ideas on the future, I shared in my science fiction, through science fiction as a <clears throat> In my science fiction, I. shared this idea of uh, the enlightened society. So in, in, this, in the character development I've implemented in, in, the, in my science fiction novel, I've, I kind of perceived, five, like this novel is set in the year 5025, I perceived human beings going through waves of enlightenment. That means the species woke up to itself a couple of times. Right now, the collective hasn't woken up, but in a thousand years, it might have woken up maybe three times. And that would be incredible collective 
efficiency. That means right now you might not believe it. You know how we look back at the early settlers and they were just like chopping wood and making, you know, houses and preparing for winter, you know, just such a simple life back then. Right? Right now we think we're so advanced and whatever, but I'm telling you, to the future we're that simple. Relaxation time. What if I told you you would you would be the most relaxed when there was no time? When you gave freedom to yourself. Some gifts only open. This is something where I don't know if we've ever heard this in history, but probably there was a guru who in, in Vedic yogic thought <coughs> or in mystical traditions where some guy came up to the guru and was like, Guru, was like, Guru, what is truth? What is the truth? What is my purpose and mission in this life? You know, what is the meaning of all this? What is truth? Tell me, what is the ultimate? And the guru was like, buddy, you're asking me about eyes that you have on you? Like, <laughs> eventually it's like, uh, pretty much think of it this way. You're a pilot. And you can choose, you should have the ability to pilot alone and to pilot with the airplane filled with passengers. <clears throat> Which means um, using whatever uh, oh God, too many metaphor infusion right now. <laughs> This episode was literally a tornado of metaphors. to get comfortable <coughs> with silence, stillness, and darkness. Means you can live, live a life where the only thing that is left to see is the other. That means it's like It's very hard to tell sometimes if what a person does is correct or not, or what a person even says is correct or not, simply because one can see different moments in history responding to the viewpoint. So as if like a person says something in 2020, and then in 2030 someone has an opinion on it, 2040 they have an opinion on it, 2050. In 2016, 2017, and on and on. And it's as if, like, imagine up to 2050, it was correct what you said, and then from 2050 to 2080, it was wrong. Then from 2080 and beyond, like, it was correct in that cultural program. So you could never tell how how efficient an idea is, and it's kind of like just something thrown in a vacuum, and just this symbol and image just moving. <clears throat> My 
my strategy personally is to uh, first uh, activate uh, an incredible search for what the mind is again. That means I'm really like you know in a unique phase of life right now. <laughs> but I will tell you like. I don't know, if you're a trillionaire out there listening or some incredibly rich philanthropist, just serve the mind of civilization and just advance communication. That is the only way out of self-extinction through ignorance. And that's all that individuals can do. Whoever you are, wherever you are in the world, for a moment, just pause and realize every person's mind is like an artwork. And this was where I was trying to get to with the sidewalk story. So guys, I did something very unique in my novel. I gave a shout out to the name Mr. Within. And uh, so anyways, eventually there are these unique figures who start the Enlightened Society in the sci-fi novel. And the Enlightened Society really begins from the first artist becoming president. The first artist. <clears throat> and this artist becomes president, and this artist chooses to make the nation more beautiful than all the other nations. Then, for the first time, the leaders of other nations begin trying to compete. No longer nations are competing for military uh, budgets. They're competing in some sense for, for in some sense, <clears throat> how beautiful and how incredible life on earth can be. You see, that is the greatest service. That is the greatest redemption for the individual. Serve your species. Or let me say it like this. Uh, if, if, let's say if a person even prioritizes serving themselves first, than your species. Let's say any time you, you are not serving yourself, serve your species. We should make that a global rule. Any time you are done helping yourself, you need to help the ground. The world began becoming beautiful, and there was a law passed that made it illegal to make architecture of buildings that was a platonic solid. That means you couldn't make skyscrapers anymore. You couldn't make like square buildings or even spherical buildings anymore. <clears throat> you had to everything had become beautiful, contemporary art. Imagine for the first time houses had clothing on. Houses had personalities, you know, or through their architecture. You know, architects right now, what are they doing? They're just, you know, 
It's like it's such basic shapes, but the geometry can be so supreme, so elegant, so optically magnificently beautiful. I would say geometry is a it's a higher dimensional body, but it is not the ultimate. It's just like pretty much like, hey guys, there's a geometrical dimension where everything exists as a geometrical shape. What do we do with this kind of over here? You know? So anyways, um, now the enlightened society. So from an artistic uh, beautification of the global scene, and of course in this sci-fi novel, uh, it was like all the things that I'm reserving myself not to say in these talks. It's like I've let myself loose. <laughs> I mean, pretty much, usually I get to say, you know, I, I, I don't uh, often filter what I say, but sometimes uh, <clears throat> I try to hear what I say before I say it. You know? You know, really all, all speech is, is causing something and observing it, the effect. And it's as if you're neither the causal position or the effect, but those are the two expression, points of expression. Anyways, the enlightened society uh, becomes <clears throat> the one government, and it becomes the first government in to be to govern multiple parallel dimensions of Earth. And by the way, <clears throat> when the Enlightened Society establishes, they they say there's a speech there. There's, there's this whole paragraph where I don't know why I can't find it anymore. Uh, but uh, uh, <clears throat> it's somewhere written. But I'll tell you this: there was this thing where this whole chapter where the Enlightened Society gives an instruction, a command. The Enlightened Society is like a government giving a command to the world. And the Enlightened Society says, from now on, all ideology is being treated as artwork and has heritage value. That means people don't go in museums and start breaking stuff. You know? So every ideological system has some sort of design value. That means there could be an ideological system which is like an artifact that we don't understand now but the future generations may. <clears throat> so the enlightened society had this perception that every ideology is art so you cannot literally make it good or bad. Art is like multiple interpretations, you know? And art is given freedom. So it's as if you see a world run by artists, it's going to become an incredible creative world, but the issue is the management. You know? <clears throat> this is why I would say advanced communicators are the, that would be the ultimate art. But uh, anyways, now,
I would say the purpose of life is to fill the void. Is to fill it. <clears throat> not to expect it to be filled, not to wait for it to be filled, but to fill the void in front of your eyes. There is a quote by Rumi that says, wherever you are, be the soul of that moment. That means, not, it's like the honoring, it's like when the self and world become inseparable, all that you honor in yourself, you see in the world. All that you've honored in the world, you see in yourself. Relaxation time. <clears throat> I, I just read your comment. I would say um, it's better not to so easily sleep. Up. Like I can tell you that there's there's so many psychological inefficiencies in the realm. That means there's a lot of behavioral irrationality. Now. It has to do with the balance of physiology and psychology. That means you could be, uh, you could have the best psychology, you could have the best kind of conditioning in life, but if you don't take care of your physiology, you descend into savagehood. So I would say that there is a dormant savageness of a sort of <clears throat> betra a betrayal of the collective. That means when one becomes proud of having no position, it's as if one has stopped playing chess with the world. That means one has stopped caring for uh, uh, the hidden heaven in her. <clears throat> or the heaven on earth. Rather. So you see, it's all about opportunity and sight, vision. If I, I, talk I said success equals efficient vision. Your vision is your awareness. The efficiency is based on how you choose your speed and how you choose your destination. I will tell you, I was um, for a year and a half I was in downtown Toronto. I could tell you, I saw <clears throat> the defeated and the successful walk in the same streets as if they were in two different dimensions. You know? You know, there's this strange feeling, you know, even I feel before uh, being introduced to the idea of yoga and the idea of yoga of detachment. I feel eventually it's like you see everybody move a certain way and you feel like, okay, maybe there's something, maybe people are giving in to Occam's razor too easily. This uh, short story where there was a sheep, a black sheep, in this crowd of white sheep, and this black sheep suddenly gets a vision. This black sheep gets a vision that all the sheep are going to the slaughterhouse. The sheep, the black sheep, that they don't like, it's imagine a, like a river of sheep, <clears throat> you know, kind of going towards like the slaughterhouse but they don't see the slaughterhouse yet, and it's just this river of sheep. And it's this black sheep that suddenly oh, oh, gets this vision of the machines of the slaughterhouse destroying the sheep. And so this black sheep starts go walking the other way. And so all the sheep are going the same direction, and this black sheep goes the other direction, and eventually this black sheep finds others who are also going back. 
And so it becomes this situation where you can't change what the what the global karma has pinpointed, has, has considered the focal point. But uh, I would say one thing, like the whole point of that story was that the world could be doing one thing and the self could totally be doing another. I can tell you that I have no idea why people were not using this when I figured this out because I consider subjective evolution as well. And I consider that there is way more. There is an unconscious life potential being there. Like, it's like, I'll give you an example. Right now I'm looking at this chair and so the thought of chair comes, right? Literally, I can visualize the letters chair in the air. <clears throat> so I'm, I look at this chair, I think of a chair, right? The thought of a chair. Now, the, the, the word chair, the idea of chair is not the chair. So similarly, if I was to look at my own biological object-based body, I would look at my body and be like, Okay, I am this body, and it has a name. My real name is Amin. So it's like, okay, this is Amin. And then in that moment, it's as if, wait a minute, that I am not the name. Similar to how this chair isn't the concept of chair, the object isn't the subject. So I am, this objective body is not the subject. Ready, the cult caught on to this mind body dualism. Now, something mysterious happens because you come to a point where you're like, wait a minute, if I'm, if my, if the object is not a subject, then how is the subject being a subject? And so this is where, if, from, if you were Noam Chomsky, I would, I would say you probably feel genetics is doing some complicated magic show. But I would say if you were, if you had a more mystical context, you would say literally, it's, it's, it's the levels of uh, experience of the attribute. It's in the sense of the, the seer of the seeing is unseen. That means the awareness to how you are aware, you are aware is unshipped, doesn't have a shape. And could matter be the shadow of space? I don't know, spheres are hovering in the middle of nowhere, anything seems to be possible. <laughs> hey guys, I don't know how many people know this, but Albert Einstein, through space time, he literally did something where I don't even feel the scientific community understands the magnitude. Einstein gave a topology, I would say, like he gave a landscape. He literally made outer space appear like mountains, I would say. In my view, of course, this is something just specific to this talk being shared here. But I'll, but I'll say, like, I am telling you, there is, a, there is something that it's as if we are in a cosmic puddle, or we are in a, our solar system, or, or the planet is in an invisible, it's like an invisible puddle. So anyways, guys, uh, thanks for listening. Um, I'm going to share the Discord link. Uh, let me see. I think it's 9 p.m. I think people should be showing uh, Discord items. So, what topic? <clears throat> Okay, I got it.
All right, everyone. Thank thank you for listening. Uh, I will be in the Discord for tonight's discussion for those interested. Much more sense, obviously. And uh, could matter be the shadow of space. Um, the shadow is technically the light, so it, what it, the, the matter is space. Or, I, excuse me, I would say light is matter. Light is matter. And, uh, I don't know, space is somehow there too. <laughs> space is invited to the party as well. <laughs> You know, all those people in history who've said, give me space, man, give me space. It's as if, how do you, how, how do you give space to someone? <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for listening.